Um, so I asked you to, to review a set of videos. Um, well, I'll be. Um, to review a set of videos uh, for this class, um, uh, for this time. Uh, they, they were on a couple topics, accountable positions, risk management, incremental delivery and assertions. And I wanna talk about each of those areas. Okay, um, so this is going to be um, kind of emblematic of uh, what we're going to do through a lot of the semester and how we use our uh, our time together is discussing these sort of matters. So, so I want to talk about risk management. Um, why do we care about why do we care about risk for projects? Anyone? Uh, uh, Jesse. Okay. Um, allow allow this plan for like unexpected effects. If we plan something nice and linear, like well, this is going to go like quick and burn down the side. Yeah. But we do no risk assessment. Yeah. As soon as like something goes wrong mm -hmm. during the development, mm -hmm. everything goes down. Right. Good. Today's risks are tomorrow's problems. Um, if if we don't aggressively attack risks, uh, risks will aggressively attack us. I didn't say those first, Tom DeMarco did, I think, but um, they're, they're sage observations. Um, um, fortunately, as Tom DeMarco notes, today's problems are tomorrow's risks. So we can learn from the problems we have and, and do better risk management. Um, what are some, so if we look at the history of software delivery, um, the statistics, particularly in early decades of software delivery, have been shocking about project failure, with like a majority of projects failing decades ago. These days, it's better because of best practices that you will be applying in this course. Uh, now, I want to reflect on that. I mean, what are some of the major types of risk that need to be prevented or managed associated with software projects. Can anyone give me some ideas? What are what are some risks, types of risk, you know, spheres of risk that can that can happen? Yes, uh, name. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is it? Yeah. Matthew. Okay. Um, different APIs or parts of software not interacting together the way you have intended. Great. Incompatibility between technologies used. Um, so maybe you want to use React together with, uh, I don't know, um, you know, this certain React library together with uh, React Native, and somehow it doesn't play nicely with the Babel compiler or something like that, um, or with the emulator that's used on Android testing or something. Okay, good. Uh, how about other spheres of risks? Yes, uh, name? Yeah. Ralph. Uh, lots of data. Okay, that's that's interesting. Um, loss of data or loss of um, it could be more than data, right? I mean, you you could you could lose um, I suppose configuration information or or components of a of a repo. And, and what sort of thing might cause that sort of loss in software? Are you talking about like from an end application, like that that user's data is lost? Or are you talking about the project loses? loses something of an asset, you know, during its development. Yeah, like like maybe a, yeah, like um during the project development, like it loses a big part that maybe users will use that kind of like affects the company. Okay, yeah, it, it can happen. We've had projects that have been subject to break in by hackers in this project and and they've had to they've had grievous loss of time and they've had to go back and reconfigure their CI pipeline and reconfigure their build machines and stuff like that. So it can happen. How about other areas of, of big risk? Yes, uh, Mumble, uh, uh, name? Mitchell. Okay. Oh, we got two Mitchells, okay. Uh-oh, uh uh-oh, uh -oh. okay, okay, yes. <clears throat> People. So if you have only one person that knows the topic, then you lose that guy, then totally. somebody else might 
Like it could take forever for somebody else to learn. Yeah. So, so, so concept in software that's very closely related to this. Anyone know the term? Okay. Yeah. So pair programming is a, is a method of helping, among other many, many virtues of pair programming, it helps buffer against um, against that phenomenon, against the vulnerabilities there. What What is this term, though? It's actually a very specific term. Yes. Uh, is this Mr. again? Matthew. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to be like hopeless. Yes, uh, Matthew. Okay, information siloing can be a problem. Yeah, because like if I specialize in the front end and you specialize in the back end and someone else is doing the design and the designer leaves, maybe I and you, you know, only have dim understanding of some principles which guided the architecture or something like that. But there's a notion of bus number. You know what the bus number is? So what's a bus number for a project? If I say my my project has a bus number of one, is that better than is is that a good thing compared to my project has a bus number of five? Which would I rather have? Yes, Matthew. Oh, I'm five. five. And what does the bus number mean? I'm gonna guess it's the number of people that have to do before the project. Okay. That's right. And or to, to put it in a more morbid way, the number of people and apologies. That have to be, this is why it's named, hit by a bus in order for the project to fail. If you have a bus number of one, why is that a problem? That person is on the bus. If, if you have one person who, who goes, you, you're like, the project might as well close up shop, right? You're, you're in real, it, it actually doesn't mean necessarily it completely fails, but it's catastrophe, you know, it's giant problems, right? Um, you spend your next 45 days trying to find a replacement and it slows down and the stakeholder is unhappy and quality goes to hell and all sorts of bad things happen. Trust me, <laughs> it can happen that way. Um, so bus numbers uh, reflect this vulnerability. People are key assets. Software engineering, software projects take place in the human theater and, and you know, this is a key aspect of it where we're, it's a socio-technical system and we're very um, vulnerable to, to um, losses that can occur in the human sphere. Um, so those are some good risks. There's many others too. Um, projects that don't, that never can, you know, that take a long time to converge because they are buggy, right? There's lots of quality problems or where it takes so long that stakeholder needs evolve so much that it's constantly chasing its tail to evolve itself to deliver only to find that the needs have changed you know they've merged with another bank and and now they need something different and and you know the, the standards have changed or what have you um what are some adverse outcomes that can come from not managing risks anyone we don't manage risk. What bad things can happen? Uh, one? Yeah. yeah. Failure of the project. Okay. Failure of a project can, that's kind of a, so true, but but it, can, can you unpack that a bit? What what do we mean by failure of the project? Often I, when I talk with stakeholders, often I ask them like, what would you consider a successful project? And failure takes many forms. Leo Tolstoy, um, uh, and Anna Karenina said, each happy family in the world is basically happy in the same basic way. Each unhappy family, does anyone know the completion of this? Is unhappy in its own unique way. And I have to say, this applies for 371 projects. <laughs> each 371 successful project is successful in its same basic way. They have a gel team working, they're applying best practices, they're keeping on top of, of the defects, they're honest about their defect backlog, they're 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 uh, willing to bear with the conflicts in the team, they're they've got shadowing going on to, to prevent vulnerabilities, and they succeed uh with high morale, high, high levels of quality, um, being careful about what they promise, etc. But failure, project failure takes many forms. It has many ugly faces. Many faces. Um, so so what particular ways could a project fail? Yes. Increase the cost. So like 
yeah. yeah. The costs run over. That's right. That's right. What's what's another one? Yes. Uh, name. Sander. Sander. I was going to say uh, in terms of the cost or like scheduling. Yeah. So schedule goes way over. Very common. We'll probably see a graph of this. Basically, every project that's delivered, for, you know, with with traditional things, where studies have been done of this, has shown that it's it's never delivered before it's estimated. And the question is only how far off is it in the taking longer than than we thought. When I was at MIT many moons ago, um, the 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 joke was, it, if you want to know how long your project will take to deliver, you you do an estimate. Okay, so maybe the estimate is it'll be done in ten days. No, not yet. You shift up to the next higher units. So you go from 10 days to 10 weeks. Then you multiply by three. You get 30 weeks and then add two. Um, so 32 weeks. Now, of course, it was a joke, but it, like many jokes, it pointed to a, to a certain unsettling truth, which is, you know, we, we often really underestimate our projects and we rarely overestimate how long things will take for a sizable project. Um, how about how about other modes of failure? Yes, uh, so uh, Daniel. The stakeholders who change the goalposts. So, who, who change the goalposts, that's right. Yeah, so stakeholders who capriciously sort of change uh, to say, and, you know, I, I said that earlier, yeah, I, I said I really wanted that. And I know it was hard to implement, but but now my needs are very different. You know, um, I saw this other cool app, and that's what I want, right? I want it to look like that. I want it to have a shine button like that. One. Now I, I'm 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 overplaying it. Actually, you got to listen carefully to stakeholders. But there are times where stakeholders change. But it's often not a fixed thing. It's like they may change if if you give them a lot of. A lot of opportunities change if it's taking a lot longer. These are these are dinergistic things. Like one can worsen the other. If you're way over time, their needs are more likely to change in that time period. Okay, so so these are just many ways. I, I actually have a book in my lab, which is called Fifty Surefire Ways to Kill a Software Project," and and it a lot of it is is sort of writ large about these. I also have another book called, called Run, Project Runaways, which is about like projects, good projects that went bad um, and, and how they went bad. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. I'm kind of a connoisseur of these. Um, uh, okay, so what are some major ways of lowering risk exposure? What are some major ways of lessening your vulnerability to risks? What can you do? Or are we at the hands of fate? The fault lies not in us, but in our stars. No, what, what are some major ways of lowering our risk? R risk exposure, yes. And your name? Braden. Braden, awesome. Documentation helps. Why does documentation help? And why can that be helpful? Why can it lower risk? It's there you go. Someone leaves, leaves a project that can can lower it. That, that it can lower the risk because someone else could come in and and read an up to date understanding of how the design works, or you know how this gnarly side of the implementation works, or or how that part of the code base interfaces with the back end or whatever, right? So 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 that's that's good. Now I'll be with you just a second, Jesse. But what's the hard part of documentation? Uh, uh, yes, Mitchell. Um, I've seen it's very hard to keep it constantly up to date over a long period. That's right. And how many people here love writing documentation? Um, um, hmm. yeah, we, we don't tend to like it. And, and actually there are projects where people have quit because they say like, I was not hired to write <laughs> volumes of documentation, like, I'm going to go to this other company that offered me a much more interesting project opportunity. And I mean, people walk and I don't want to overplay it, but one of the advantages of working software is we often have choice, particularly if you're, if you're at a strong level. And um, 
I, here's the deal. And for those who are in 394, you, you may get some resonance here. Um, there's kind of lock-in effects in software, viewing it from a complex system standpoint. Projects can end up in a really, really good state where they're gelled, that people's morale is really high, the turnover rate is low, the code base quality is commensurately higher because people are really interested in this project and they've been there a long time. They can they can put in place high quality code. They feel it's a matter of professional pride to do that. Basically, the team members know each other. They they basically understand each other's way of thinking about it. They've shared a lot of background on, on their areas of the code. So they basically know it really well. And the team performs with a minimal need for documentation because first of all, the turnover is low, so they don't it's not really prized. And they just they they understand the code base so well and and they're and they're able to communicate really well. You contrast that with another type of project, maybe the same one under a bad manager about six months later, where you have high turnover. You have people coming in who don't know the code base as a result. You have, you know, problems with quality as a result, right? Defects coming into it because of misunderstandings in the code. The QA team is always placing, playing catch up. The stakeholders are angry at the project. People are demoralized, they leave. They spend a lot of their time hiring new people who then turn out to leave within two months. And the project spirals and it's always fighting fires and it's a mess to work. I've seen both ways. And the fact is documentation is key if you're in a situation where you know there's high turnover documentation is less important because the risks are so much lower of turnover in teams that are gelled that are that are really performing at a high level and have very high morale and i could list you know various teams like that, some of which i've been part of in professional software development so the the point here is that um you know our um our investments sometimes uh to lower risks themselves have you know, uh, costs, and they make sense in certain contexts more than more than others. And things like documentation are a great investment where you do have serious turnover. You have to think about. In some cases, you're lucky enough to not have it, and it helps the team be more nimble, move much faster, with much higher velocity. Right? You think the Apple, the Apple Macintosh first development team, or think about the Excel team I was part of, et cetera. These are these are fast moving teams that can that can deliver value. Um, other other comments on ways to lower risk. Yes, Abby. Uh, measures or metrics for evaluating success or failure. Yeah, so so that can help. So um, being honest about um, our uh, our co bases uh, quality situation by by you know keeping track of. Of defect counts uh, periodically doing estimates of defects, including some that haven't been found yet. We'll find out ways to do this. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe putting in place code metrics, um, uh, recording uh, something about our velocity, keeping track of how good our estimates are for how long things will take versus the actual time. Burnout chart. And, and, and sorry, burnout. Burn down, burn down Bur yeah, burn down chart is, is 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 also a good investment. That's right. So so these are these are ways we can help. But there's two things that I discussed in my project video in my video on risk management that I'm waiting for people to answer. Daniel, contingency and what's a contingency plan? It's, we have a plan if something does go wrong. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So it's not that we make a big investment up front. It's rather we make a plan so that if something happens, we're able to nimbly respond to it. We know exactly what we need to do, who we need to talk with, how to coordinate it. And so if it happens, we can act on it immediately, not fumble around and be discoordinated. And that can really help. What's another method? What's another way, the sort of converse way? Yes, uh, name? Class. Class? We can mitigate. Mitigate it, that's right. And that's putting an investment in place now that will lessen the chance it will happen, or if it does happen, it will it will lessen its the damage it does. 
So we can put in place some efforts right now that will, will head it off. We're definitely putting them into place. It's not like contingency plan where it's, if this happens, we do that. No, we're putting it into place now to make sure we head it off. These are ways to lessen our vulnerability. And I do expect you to enumerate your risks, to do risk scanning. What is risk scanning, anyone? What's risk scanning? Yes, name? Uh, come on. Come on. Identifying risk factors and then ordering them by how severe they are, so how likely yep. they are to happen and how detrimental they would be if they do happen. Just take a look. Exactly. And then articulating for the higher priority ones how you want to respond to it. You know, I can't rule out that for some you may just say we're going to accept this risk. It's it will tolerate it. We 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 talked about it. Mitigating and contingency planning are too expensive. We're willing to tolerate it. We think the risk is so low because the risk exposure, what's risk exposure? What does that combine? Two things. Yes, uh, name? Matthew. Matthew. Impact and likelihood. Yeah, impact and likelihood. Often it's treated as the product of some sort of subjective probability and, and, and impact score. Um, uh, if it's low enough, we might accept it. Otherwise we might put in place contingency plans, put in place mitigation measures, right? Sometimes we transfer the risk and we say, well, oh, we're going to avoid it. We're not going to use that technology. Instead, we'll use this other. And often that's kind of transferring the risk to another sphere, right? Um, okay. Um, so these are good. And, and I expect you, for your teams, to be engaged in ongoing risk scanning. This means looking for risks previously identified that are coming about, that are so-called material rising, as well as new types of risk that go on, that change during the semester. Hmm? Um, and risks will often evolve. Early on in the semester, what's a, what's a serious risk that a project might face in this course early on in the semester that doesn't apply that much later on in the semester? Yes, people dropping. people dropping. That's right. And after hearing this lecture, they might drop like flies. Um, <laughs> but, um, but later in the semester, you might have very different ones, right? All these projects for these different courses are due at the same time and so on. Okay. Um, and, uh, I think Jesse, I promised to get back to you on something. I can't remember what, but okay. Sorry. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so that was a bit with, uh, with risk management. Um, incremental deliverables. That was another topic I asked you to review some video. Why does so much software, I mean, these days we, you know, is, is the day and age of, of incremental software delivery. Much of it implemented through agile software development processes. Not all, but, but many. What, what are, give me an example of an agile methodology, an ag agile software development methodology. Anyone know some some names for those? Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Quan? Yeah. yeah. Scrum. Scrum is good. Good. Exactly. What's another one? If I said XP, does that mean anything? Extreme, Extreme programming. What's another one? Kanban. Yeah, Kanban is another one. Good. There's there's a whole series, and, and they differ in some of the details, but uh, one key thing that's involved in all, they have certain... There's an agile manifesto for those who, who are not familiar with it. It's worth looking up. Uh, uh, Ken Bayek, uh, Rumba, Booch, um, uh, uh, Tom DeMarco, I think, and others were involved in formulating it. Um, and you may find it interesting. It's, it's an interesting and a worthwhile document to read, the agile manifesto. But one thing they all have in common, set of features in common, and one of them is incremental delivery. Why do we develop software incrementally? Why not just develop it and develop it and develop it and then deliver it? Yes, uh, name? Sorry, sorry? Initial feedback from the- Yeah, we get feedback from the stakeholder. Yeah, good, good. How about, how about others? Yes. Adapts to change, including possibly change stakeholder demands but also change sense on the part of a stakeholder as to, you know, 
they thought they wanted it this way. And some, oh, it doesn't look good. Could you unpack this into two screens instead of one? Could you change this to be a bit more flexible with that, right? Sometimes just seeing the interface makes us realize, oh, no, actually we wanted a bit different or, oh, you, you know, I didn't communicate it well. I actually wanted it more like this. So, so yeah, getting that feedback is key. What, what else? Yes, um, and uh, Kamal? Continuously delivers value. Continuously delivers value. I love it. Yes, that's exactly right. And and so you're each time you're iterating. Hopefully you're you're delivering, you know, another feature or you know improved quality that helps you know root out some defects that were in there or or makes it higher performance. Um, uh, makes it more you know run on on an uh, additional. Um, range of, of uh, devices or what have you. So that's that's good. How about other things? Uh, yes, name? And what about uh, risk management here? So, so like, uh, when you're doing agile like, you know, methodology, like for each risk or like iteration, you like come together and you can like right. uh, assess the risk yeah. and you come to date. That's right. That's right. And so each, each excellent, excellent plot. So each incremental deliverable, we often go and assess risk and we learn about our risks. And each deliverable, we often collapse risk. In fact, this is one of the reasons we we prioritize. There was another hand up back there too. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Daniel. Yeah, it forces us to do regression testing because time was, and this is still a tendency among developers, a lot of developers, they want to develop, they want to develop, they want to develop. And if you let them just develop, 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 often they don't do enough what? Testing. And then, and they often don't test against other people's code that they're developing. And then there's what's called the big bang problem. What's the big bang? Trying to combine the code last thing. Combine, combining these code bases that I've been working on for three months, you've been working on for three months, he's been working for three months, she's been working on for three months. And we try to combine them together, and guess what happens? The big what? The big bang. Like it never comes together. It never comes together. There's a famous uh, famous software project at Microsoft called Omega. It was supposed to be the replacement for. I think for the access database, um, and it, it never converged. Partly because of this, it was it just never came together. So we deliver software incrementally for a variety of reasons, and and I will post, you know, some of these. But um, you know, we can get stakeholder feedback. We can resolve risks, right? And, you know, and, and for ID one, a big. Part of when I say I want like a first deliverable, a good part of that can be spike prototype. What's a spike prototype? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, come on. I think it was a prototype through like concept on a very specific topic and then you throw it away. Man, you're good. That's exactly right. That that's exactly right. You hit all the right points. Um so uh here um when we're often dealing with the risks, we want to know are these Technologies compatible? Do they work together well? How how hard is it to do this? Undertake this certain task? So we resolve risks here. Um, we resolve uncertainties. But other things were mentioned: the ability to learn, right? Update plans, get feedback from stakeholders on acceptability of an implementation, right? Um, guidance on next priority. What's what's next? What what do they think? You know, would be the next feature they'd love to see. Um, they're getting clear on, on the feature set that they want, clarifying their ideas. Because, you know, it's hard for us. We, as computer scientists, we live in a computational world. We're constantly exposed to different interfaces. For stakeholders, someone trained in, you know, pharmacy or someone trained in archaeology or, or someone trained in, you know, medicine, for them to imagine a user interface, we, we often don't realize just how hard that is for some. And so you have to show it to them somehow, get something in front of them where they can rip off of it. You know, they could say, oh, that's that's close, but it's not it's not quite what I want, right? Um uh so so here we can um further with incremental delivery integrate different threads of development. Um 
we can enforce time boxing. What is time boxing? I said it from this this very podium, not uh, five days thence. What what is time boxing? Yes, uh, 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 Matthew. Yeah. Yes. Um, instead of necessarily giving testament of we think it's going to take this long, and then you work on it, both done, and see that it's just no, I have two days. I have two weeks, or I have three weeks. This is all I have, you know. Um, uh, so, so these incremental deliverables can force you into this time boxed mindset, because otherwise things can just and, and it's the next bullet point, right? You, you can get extreme schedule overruns, which was the hallmark of many software projects before incremental delivery, and you deliver value along the way. Um, uh, now, what, what might motivate uh, a, a given deliverable um, to be delivered early? What, like, what, what things might you take into account when you, what things might specifically motivate, hey, I want to deliver this soon? What, what's something? Yeah, yes, come on. If you're, are you talking from like a stakeholder perspective? Or is this kind of uh, I, I think team working with stakeholders in, in those discussions by which, you know, they come to a decision on what to implement, including some state, including some team technical considerations, which may be what you're getting at. What things might motivate something to be done sooner? Yes, uh, name? Evander. Uh, Evander, yeah. yes. Uh, so like refactoring code and maintaining. Yeah, you know this code is really crafty, right? And and it's not. It needs a refactor. It needs a shower. It needs it needs like some some. Good, serious updates. Okay, good. Uh, what's another thing? Yes, uh, name? Uh, uh, Bob's, yes. I'm like changing the stakeholders needs. Like after you walk to them for a while, they realize that you don't actually need all those features how you ask for initially. Okay, okay, yeah. So so often what may motivate something sooner is, is you know, stakeholder feedback about what they really want, right? What they want next, right? What, what would deliver value for them or, or what they're, what they think is is important uh next how about other things that might motivate and evander yeah um so user feedback yeah yeah user feedback uh is 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 a really good one um they might say i want this next okay so that's related to the last one what else yes uh uh, uh jesse um, it's something that All right. Yeah. If one thing depends on another, if it, if B depends on A, you might want to get a, a started soon to position yourself to deliver on B later to give you that option, right? Because if you don't start on A soon, you're, you're not going to have the flexibility, the real option of, of delivering on B. Yeah. So uh, good. Yes, uh, Ardalan. Uh, also, sometimes you might want to actually deliver from a uh, part A faster because it will provide you the funding for the technology. Yeah, yeah. So delivery of value might secure you some remuneration, some 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 you know, get you in some funds that would support further development. So um one thing I I'm not hearing is you know higher risk um that have to be resolved. That's a big motivation. Moreover, um uh, you know, you, you often need to consider the opportunity cost. What do I mean by opportunity cost? It's a testable concept. What do I mean by opportunity cost? If I could, if I say I could, I could choose A or B or C or D. What do I mean by needing to consider the opportunity cost? Yes, yes, um, Jesse. What opportunities they're giving up by choosing? Yeah. Their yeah, I'm told. I'm not a scholar of Latin, um, but I'm told that. The word decide um, means to cut off. So you're choosing A, maybe, but if by choosing A, that means you can't get B, C, and D. You know, that compared to if you, if you did B, you could get C and D as well because it's so cheap. You have to consider the opportunity cost, what you're ruling out by making choices. It's not just what value you get from that choice. It's what value you can't get because of the things ruled out. Do you get that point? Yeah. And finally, the lead time, right? There, there, are some, there are some things that that just take a while to develop. And again, we got to get 
cracking on it soon or else it's not going to get developed right um okay so 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 this is good um some some key concepts there let me ask about let me ask about uh assertions um so i, I want to ask more generally um it's sometimes said the best defense is a good offense what are some ways of going on the offensive uh for quality assurance of a project what are some ways of being proactive of preventing things not being not merely reacting to defects as they come up to problems as they come up what are some things to go on the offensive to to take action proactively yes come on so you said using assertions to confirm something yes you follow my thoughts exactly using assertions is is one way to go on the offense and and why is it why does it help us go on the offense? Why do I say it's going on the offense using assertions? What am I doing with putting in assertions? What what is it? What am I what what is an assertion? Here, um, Daniel. Yeah. That's right. I'm I'm encoding my understanding as a software developer of you know what preconditions should be in place, for example, what properties should be guaranteed. Right. Um, uh, what what the value of certain variables should be relative to another. That I should be greater than J at this point. I'm putting in place my understanding, and I'm operationally checking right in the code. And and that's not merely waiting for a defect to show its face. It's like actively checking my understanding is correct. Um. Uh. And and. Uh, when I'm putting in place those, it's finding problems much quicker, much closer to their source often than if a bug popped up. If a bug popped up, who knows? Maybe it was a bad value that had been stored in the database much earlier, and now is where I'm loading it in and it blows up, right? But if I'm putting in place an assertion, it's it's testing often much earlier to the source of the problem. And I'm more likely to find it early before it propagates to who knows what data structures, to who knows what areas of the of the program, what databases it's put in, what data structures it's stored in. Um, so um, where can assertions commonly be put into place? Where 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 might you where might you put assertions in place in your code base? Uh, Kamal. Oh, oh sorry, uh, Thomas. I even called him you for one. Unimplemented functions. Um, sorry. Unimplemented functions. Unimplemented functions. Yeah, yeah. You don't want a stub version, a fake version of this called, you know, inadvertently. So that's good. Yeah. If you have an area of the code that shouldn't be called, it's just a placeholder for now to put in place. Um, you want to make sure it's not code. Uh, it's not called. Another thing. Yeah. Where, where's another good place to put assertions? Yes. Uh, to find bugs. Sorry. To find bugs. Well, yeah, so their goal is to find defects and particularly defects, you know, where a, a developer, a programmer's understanding, their reasoning is just not, it doesn't hold computation. In other words, that what's going on computationally is not in line with their what their understanding is of what it should be. Assumptions. Their assumptions, yes, are off base. But it's not just assumptions about like the user will click the correct buttons because like we don't want to handle user confusion with an assertion why not why not just why not just say the user <laughs> the user doesn't enter a proper name the user doesn't enter a middle name we're gonna throw an assertion why not just say uh what the heck i i, I want to only assume that they are always going to have a middle name and i'll throw an assertion if they don't why is that bad why is that bad in style yeah why is it bad why is it inappropriate use of assertions? Hard one. Because if you use that, actually, it yeah. might make the user kind of assume that we don't care about them, so they would actually that, that, quit the app. That's true, and it, and it, it's not caring about them. It's actually darn right. It's not caring, and it's 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 unacceptable to check that the user has done as according to our bidding. You know, we use an assertion. An assertion is used to check that our reasoning is correct. That are reasoning aligns with what's in the program. What other quality assurance best practices help use of assertions or enhance their value? Anyone? 
What other quality of shrug breath? Help. Let me count the ways. Yes, uh, Matthew. Logging. Logging. Excellent. Darn right, it helps a lot because you can often see why an assertion failed from nearby log messages leading up to it, for example. Um, what's another another uh, thing that could help? Yes. Uh, or, we don't want to represent, you folks could start to pack up. We don't want to, yeah. uh, to represent arcane info to the user. Well, th that's that's true. So yes, we'd like we that's a good point. We'd like an assertions message to provide information to a developer as to debug it, but also to not freak out the user yeah. if it occurs. To give a high level thing that is comforting to the user, but let, let them know we're on top of this. But how about something else too? Any, anyone else? What other things help assertion use? Maybe you should be thinking about this, but I'd say testing works with assertions because testing can try a variety of cases. And if any of them throw assertions, you want to know as soon as possible. You want to know if the programmer's understanding is off, you want to know that as soon as possible. And tests can help try it under different circumstances and find if even one of them, the programmer's understanding is not the case, that's important. Specifications. What's a specification? What's a specification? Speak on as if you're a Greek chorus. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, it doesn't even have to be a Greek chorus, even one stentorian voice. Yes, name? Yeah, well, requirements have to be specified, but there's specifications associated with code. What what are, what are those? What are those, sir, to, to encode? Yes, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, so they, they, they specify what a piece of software does, you know, like what the preconditions are, what the postconditions, how it functions, you know, what it accomplishes. And encoding those gives you lots of material by specifying post conditions, as Thomas noted, probably one class ago. Um, for example, they give us fruitful sorts of things to check with assertions, not only with tests, but with assertions. That's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. But I'm pleased to see this dialogue. And I, I, I will tell you, I'm glad to be learning some names, glad to be, glad to be recognizing but I, I, I have to confess, I'll be back to square one because as soon as people move, I, it's like I passed their location and what they're wearing today to be their name. So God forbid Matthew changes from a green a green sweatshirt back there and sits up here, I'll be hopeless. So, okay, okay, that's good. That's good, awesome, thank you. Okay, we'll see you next time.